with me in turning to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. If you're visiting with us tonight for the first time, we have been studying the book of Hebrews now for several weeks, studying our way through this book. We come tonight to the seventh chapter, and we're going to be looking at the first ten verses of this chapter, Hebrews chapter 7. The way that uh, preaching takes place in a church should reflect our belief, not only in the inerrancy of Scripture, but the sufficiency of Scripture. That's one of the reasons why we preach expositionally through books of the Bible, because we trust that the Word of God in all of its variety is needed by the church. When you do that, however, as you know, as, as you've experienced, you're going to meet with more than one kind of passage. There are going to be sections that are just easier for us to understand. There are going to be sections that are more difficult for us to understand. But we dive into the more difficult sections with full confidence that these things are needed in the life of the church. Just because it may not be apparent to us why they're needed as opposed to some other sections, really doesn't matter. What matters is that we know they are needed. And so tonight's passage is, is one of those more difficult to understand, but we know we need this. Look what it says beginning at verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham, and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes, through Abraham, where he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Let's go to our God together in prayer this evening. Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word. Every word that we have in our Bibles is pure. It's been tested. It is absolutely trustworthy. And we need every part of it. So we ask you tonight, Lord, to strengthen both the preacher and the listener. Grant us, Lord, clear thoughts and help me, Lord, to explain things as clearly as I can. And then, Lord, strengthen us in our inner man to be able to receive the things that we see. Lord, I pray that you would plant these things that we learn deep in our hearts and seal them there. And work in us in such a way that your word bears much fruit in our lives. As has already been mentioned, we pray for anyone in our midst who doesn't know Jesus. Lord, we ask that perhaps even tonight would be the night when they come to know your son in truth. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Melchizedek has been mentioned three times so far in the book of Hebrews. And every time the writer has mentioned Melchizedek, he has made the point that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
We saw this in chapter 5, verse 6. We saw this in chapter 5, verse 10. And then we saw this this morning in chapter 6, verse 20. Look at chapter 6, verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he's made mention of this now three times. Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. It is now time for him to explain what he means. That's what he does here in the seventh chapter. He explains how Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek and why that has significance. And as he does this, he's going to be accomplishing two very specific things. He will demonstrate once again the superiority of Jesus. Now, I know the person in view in these verses is Melchizedek, but I want you to understand that he's really not the one focused on. Though he is the one made use of, where the writer's really driving is that we might see the greatness of Jesus. That's what he's after. Remember, if your struggle is leaving behind old covenant preparation to embrace new covenant reality, that's the struggle these Jewish Christians are battling with as they're being persecuted, willing to, to, in a final sort of way, walk away from this tug back to old covenant practices, walk into the fullness of new covenant reality. If If that's the struggle, then he wants these people to understand that they leave behind what is shadow for what is substance. They're leaving behind what is limited and inferior and temporary for what is perfected and greater and forever. In other words, they're not losing, they're gaining. They must not be intimidated by those who would persecute them for their faith in Jesus. They must be convinced that they've embraced God's answer for their salvation, the fulfillment of all Old Testament promise. And so once again, he is demonstrating the superiority, the preeminence of the Son of God. There's a second thing he accomplishes in this chapter. That is, he's also going to answer how Jesus serves as a priest in a way that fulfills Old Testament promise. Does the Christian view of the priesthood of Jesus have biblical merit? If you look at the Old Testament, was the priesthood of Jesus anticipated and prepared for in the Old Testament revelation? Jesus was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. He does not fulfill Levitical promise. So how does Jesus fulfill priestly promise in the Old Testament? Why is the Levitical priesthood insufficient? Is there an Old Testament picture of priesthood that pointed forward to what would be realized in Jesus? The writer of Hebrews is saying there is. The kind of priest that Jesus is is not pictured in the Levitical priesthood, but in the priesthood of Melchizedek. And he's going to explain how that works. Now, one important thing to bear in mind as we look at this is that this is doctrine for the mature. Remember that that, um, as we walk through this carefully and as we feel the difficulty of it, this is precisely what the writer was concerned about earlier. In chapter 5, verse 11, he said, about this we have much to say, talking about Melchizedek. He says, and it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And when he's talking about maturity, what he's talking about is moving forward into the truths of the new covenant. That is, you can only embrace these truths about Jesus if you're willing to move forward into the New Testament fulfillment 
of Old Testament promises. You have to have a mind willing to see what God is revealing here. You can't be stubborn. You can't be doubting and receive what He teaches here. You have to be willing to see what God is revealing. Let me just say as a side note that that's an important part an uh, important point regarding communication of Christian doctrine in general. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis sometimes we place on apologetics. Apologetics have their place. I'm convinced that apologetics is really more for the encouragement of the Christian than for the conversion of the lost man. There's no doubt we ought to have solid reasons for the things that we believe. We ought to be ready to give an account for the hope that is ours but dear ones, you do understand that no lost person has ever been converted by the strength of our argument. God makes use of strong arguments, but the truth is any lost person who has ever been saved has been saved not by the strength of our arguments, but by the power of the Spirit of God through the gospel proclaimed. Unbelievers are convinced because God changes their hearts. Before God teaches someone, He makes them hungry for the truth. Before He teaches someone, He brings them to a point where they're willing to admit what they don't know. And then being hungry, being made hungry for the truth, being made willing to receive the truth, then they're able to perceive what God has revealed in His Word as His Spirit works in their hearts. I say that to to make the point that there's no doubt some would look at what the writer says here about Melchizedek and Jesus and not be convinced. But that doesn't mean it's not true. For the person willing to know the truth, a beautiful picture emerges here. A heart ready to do God's will is necessary if you're going to know God's will. Are you, are you desiring to know God's will? Do you desire to know the truth? Jesus said in John 7, 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. That's quite a powerful statement. If your will is to do God's will, if you want to know God's will and to do God's will, Jesus says, then you'll be able to perceive that I'm not speaking on my own authority, but I'm giving you the truth. That's how God teaches people. He makes them hungry, He makes them willing, and then they're able by His Spirit to see what He reveals. The interpretation that the writer here gives us concerning Melchizedek, he's going to make use of Genesis chapter 14, but he's interpreting Genesis 14 in the light of a statement made in Psalm 110. You'll remember if you've been with us that he uses Psalm 110 over and over again throughout this book. And specifically, what, he's, what he has in mind is Psalm 110, verse 4. But listen to it in its context. This is, this is a messianic statement in Psalm 110. Listen to verse 1, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. That is, the Messiah is going to be a king, a divine king, verse 3. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament, Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. And there in Psalm 110, the Holy Spirit makes plain that the Messiah is going to be a priest forever, not after the Levitical order, but after the order of Melchizedek. Now the Holy Spirit, through the writer of Hebrews, makes this comparison. And it's the eyes of faith that will allow us to understand the typology. What he wants us to see is that Melchizedek is a god ordained type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Melchizedek of the Old Testament was ordained by God, meant by God on the pages of Scripture to be a type, a facsimile as it were, of His Son, a way to look 
at this man and understand something about God's son. He's going to serve as a type. What do we mean when we talk about a type or we talk about typology? I thought John MacArthur did a good job of summarizing what we mean by typology. He wrote this, in biblical study, a type refers to an Old Testament person, practice, or ceremony that has a counterpart and antitype in the New Testament. In that sense, types are predictive. The type pictures or prefigures the antitype. The type, though it is historical, real, and of God, is nonetheless imperfect and temporary. The antitype, on the other hand, is perfect and eternal. Types are frail illustrations at best. They are analogies. And like all analogies, they correspond to the person or thing to which they are compared only in certain ways, perhaps only in one way. Though Melchizedek is in no way the equal of Christ, his unique priesthood and even his name typify Jesus Christ and his work in a number of significant ways. So you understand, he's saying, and he's right, that what God has done as Hebrews 7 makes clear, is he gave us Melchizedek in the Old Testament, not only a historical reality giving us the historical information about his encounter with Abraham, but now God meant for this man to serve as a type, a a prefigurement, a picture of his son who was to come later. doesn't mean that Melchizedek is to be compared to Jesus in every way, but there are certain things about Melchizedek that speak to us of Jesus. And what the Holy Spirit is doing now in Hebrews 7 is he's pulling out some of those things about Melchizedek that speak to us concerning Jesus. Three points as we look at these 10 verses tonight. The first one is this, the historical situation summarized for the comparison. This is what he does in verses 1 and 2. He just briefly summarizes. He takes the, the reader's mind, the listener's mind, back to Genesis chapter 14 by summarizing what we have in Genesis 14 and and by bringing us up to speed on the historical situation, he's about to make a comparison. Notice what he says in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, so he's a king and a priest, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him... Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. Stop there. He's just summarizing now the history that's found in Genesis 14. So let me pick up the story, not the entire thing, but Genesis 14 beginning at verse 14. Listen to what the Bible says. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive. Stop there. There's a war that has taken place. First war recorded in, in Scripture. Kings from the east have attacked kings from the west, and kings from the west around the Dead Sea area have been taken captive. That includes the king of Sodom, and it included Lot being taken captive. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, which indicates, by the way, the kind of wealth and influence that Abram had. If you have 318 men who serve you, then you consider their wives and children. He probably had somewhere around a thousand people who were his servants that he took care of. He took took 318 men born in his house, trained, and went in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided his forces against them by night. It's going to be a surprise attack. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. After his return from the defeat of Kador Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, 
who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Okay, that's the history. That happened. That's real life. And now the writer of Hebrews is taking that real life history and bringing it before our minds and our eyes tonight because he wants to teach us something about Jesus ultimately. So the second thing I want you to notice, that's the historical situation summarized for the comparison. Second, notice the historical similarities between Melchizedek and Jesus that, are, that he's now going to examine for the, for the purpose of comparison. Notice verse 2, he says, he is first, speaking now of Melchizedek, he is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he's also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, get this, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So he's, he's emphasizing here, here's why I'm bringing up Melchizedek, because he resembles Jesus. And understand when he says he resembles Jesus, this is a, a literary resemblance. There were things about Melchizedek not recorded in the Bible. But the writer of Hebrews is just taking what has been recorded in the Bible, what we have on the pages of Scripture, and based on what we have and do not have on the pages of Scripture, now this man resembles Christ. And it's a God-ordained resemblance. God has recorded Melchizedek's history in such a way that he could serve us in the way that he serves us in these verses. This is the wisdom of God on display. And he resembles Jesus in two ways, in terms of his identity and in terms of his history. First of all, his identity. He is a king priest. That's his role, a king priest. His name, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Melek, king. Tzedek, righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And he, he is king of Salem. And the root of that word is associated with the word shalom. He, he is, by virtue of the name of the city, he is king of peace. He is a king priest, king of righteousness. That's his, what his name means, the etymology of his name. And then you talk about the city that he's king over. That speaks of peace. His identity resembles Jesus. And then his history. It says he is without father or mother or genealogy. Now he's talking about what is recorded in the Bible. We don't have the record of this man's beginning. We don't have the record of this man's end. We're not told where he comes from. We're not told about mother or father. We're not told where he goes after the encounter with Abraham. There he is on the pages of God's word without beginning, without end. And as a result, his priesthood goes on forever. In terms of where we leave him on the pages of God's Word, there's no end to his priesthood. He says, having neither beginning of days, verse 3, nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. As far as what we know on the pages of God's Word, his priesthood continues on. Christ is all of these things, isn't he? but in a perfect way. Jesus is not only a king, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is king of heaven and earth. He's a divine king. He is the God king. He's not just the king of righteousness in name. He's the king of righteousness in reality. The perfect and righteous and holy one. That's who Jesus is. Acts 3.14 says, as Peter preaches there in Solomon's portico, he declares, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. 
In Jeremiah 23, verse 5, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Not only righteous in himself, but able to give as a gift the righteousness that makes one acceptable to God. He's not just the king of a city with the name that speaks of peace. He's the prince of peace. His reign, his everlasting reign will be characterized by peace. And entrance into his kingdom means that you have everlasting peace with God. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10 says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. He is not just, Jesus is not just without beginning and end based on the information recorded about him. The divine nature of the Son of God has no beginning and no end. This is the eternal Son of God who has become man in order to save us from our sins. The Messiah is the God-man. And so as the eternal Son of God, He had no beginning and He has no end. It's not just based on historical information, it's reality. And He serves as a priest in an everlasting way, again, not just based on historical record, but in reality. He lives now. He lives forever to intercede for us. He's been raised from the dead. He's ascended into heaven, and forever He is our great high priest. Melchizedek resembles Jesus, but he's only meant to point us to Jesus that we would see in this resemblance what is in fact greater and perfected and real. Not something that's just symbolic and shadowy, but something that is substantive and real in the Lord Jesus Christ. So verses 1 and 2, he summarizes the history to make a comparison. Then in verse 2 and 3, he points out similarities between Melchizedek and Jesus, and he begins this comparison... And now in verses 4 through 10, what he does, the third thought is this. He, he demonstrates that by these similarities and by this comparison, what is demonstrated is the superiority of Jesus. Because, listen, if he can demonstrate that Melchizedek was superior to Abraham and superior as a result to Levi and his descendants... If Melchizedek was greater, then what of the, of the one who is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the one who's actually greater than Melchizedek? What of him? He's, he's greater. And so by pointing out the greatness of Melchizedek, he points out the greatness of Jesus. Look at verse 4. See how great this man, Melchizedek, was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are, are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. He says, let's compare Melchizedek to Abraham 
and his descendants to Abraham and Levi, and in doing so, there are five indications here of the greatness of this man Melchizedek. Notice he focuses our attention on the greatness of the man, verse 4. See how great this man was. Recognize the greatness of Melchizedek. Well, what indicates his greatness? Five things. First of all, his greatness is indicated by gifts, by giving, by gifts, by tribute. See how great this man was to whom? Abraham the patriarch. And by saying the patriarch, he's emphasizing something. The father, Abraham the father. The father of our people, he's saying to these Jewish believers. The father of the Jewish people. The father of Levi. Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, you see, to this man Melchizedek. And in that way, the superiority of Melchizedek is demonstrated. He doesn't emphasize here the fact that Melchizedek brought out wine and bread and ministered to Abraham. He doesn't emphasize that. He emphasizes this giving of the spoils, this this tenth of what he had taken through war. He now acknowledges the priesthood of Melchizedek by giving a tithe to this man. Abraham didn't receive a tenth from Melchizedek. Melchizedek received a tenth from him. That speaks of the greatness of Melchizedek. Not only by gifts, his superiority, his greatness is demonstrated by his authority. Melchizedek's authority. Verse 5, And those descendants of Levi, the priests, the Levitical priests, who receive the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. God ordained that the Levitical priests would be the ones who received the tithes there in the nation of Israel. It was according to the law of Moses that this was established. So they had their authority based on the law that God had given, and they inherited their office. It was because of birth. It was because of physical descent that they ended up in the position they were in where they received tithes. According to the law of God, according to physical descent, all descended from Abraham through Levi. But what of Melchizedek? Well, he wasn't descended from Abraham. He didn't receive his authority based upon the law of Moses, which came later. No, he received his authority directly from God. God chose him. God ordained him. In fact, he's going to make this point later on. We see this in verse 15. Look down at verse 15. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is, God swears an oath concerning his son that he's going to serve as a priest forever in a way similar to the fact that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God, not according to the law of Moses, not according to physical descent, but according to the choice of God. And Abraham paid tithes to him. So this is a superior order, you see. The Levites, descended from Abraham, received tithes from their brothers, their equals. But this man received tithes from Abraham, and he was chosen by God for the role that he had. So his greatness demonstrated by gifts, his greatness demonstrated by authority. Third, his greatness is demonstrated by blessing. Notice the way that the writer puts this at the end of verse 6. And blessed him who had the promises. You get that? Who had the promises. Now, this morning we talked about the wonder of these promises. 
So here you have the patriarch, Abraham, who has received these promises from God. And yet there is one who is in such a position that he can bless the one who has received the promises. By the way, you read Numbers 6, verses 23 through 27, you'll see that God ordained that the Levitical priests were meant to bless the people. In that way, they would sort of put the name of God onto the people of God. They would bless the people. Well, here's a priest who blesses the father of the priests of Israel. He blesses the one who has the promises. And the writer drives this point home in verse 7 when he says, It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So who paid tithes to whom? That speaks of the greatness of Melchizedek. Where did his authority derive? Not from Abraham and physical descent and the law of Moses, but from God. That speaks of the greatness of Melchizedek. And who blessed whom? Melchizedek blessed Abraham, even the one who had received these promises from God. That speaks of the superiority of Melchizedek. Fourth, his superiority is demonstrated by duration. By duration, the duration of his priesthood. Look at verse 8. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. In fact, a priesthood ordained by God to come to an end. The Levitical priesthood no longer operates. That's by God's design. We'll learn more about that in the verses that follow, verses 11 and following. Ties are received in case of the, of, the, of the Levitical priesthood just by mortal men. But in the other case, in the case of Melchizedek, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. By one whose priesthood, just based upon the record of Scripture, never comes to an end. One speaks of a priesthood that, is, that, repre- that, that, that represents mortality, it's temporary in nature. The other speaks of a priesthood that is everlasting in nature, thus Psalm 110 verse 4. An everlasting priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Which one is greater, the one that comes to an end or the one that continues on forever? So in terms of giving, he is superior. In terms of authority... He is superior in terms of blessing. He is superior in terms of duration, the duration of his priesthood. He is superior. Fifth, in terms of his status, or we could even say, I guess, in terms of of submission. Because the writer wants to take it a step further. There's something he says we need to notice, verse 9, one might even say, if you want to take this argument a step further, here's something else we might say, that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. You want to talk about the superiority of the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek to the Levitical priesthood Just pay attention to the fact that those who receive tithes actually paid tithes to Melchizedek. How? Verse 9, through Abraham. For he, Levi, was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Who is greater, Abraham or Levi? The patriarch or the descendant? And if the patriarch paid tithes to Melchizedek when Levi was in his loins, then in that sense he represented Levi in the paying of those tithes, and that demonstrates the greatness of the order of Melchizedek as compared to the order of the Levitical priesthood. In all these ways, he is saying, can't you see that Melchizedek is greater? 
And if Melchizedek is greater than the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood that is represented by him is greater. And we're talking about our great high priest, verse 20, who is after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek resembles him. He is designed by God to point us to him. He's designed by God to teach us about him. Everything we can say about Melchizedek is perfected in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is found to be greater in the Lord Jesus Christ. In all these ways, he's saying, look at your Savior. Look at your great high priest. Don't be afraid to move from the shadow to the substance, from something that God ordained for a time to that which represents something that goes on forever. You've not lost, you've gained. When you embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior and priest, King and priest. Let me close tonight, dear ones, by not only doing what the text has done, that is just point us to Jesus, but I want to make three points as we, as we finish this evening. First of all, we stand in awe at the wisdom of God and the wonder of progressive revelation. What is God doing throughout time? He is, from, from, the, from the very beginning of time until eternity, what is God doing? He is, he is putting himself on display. History is nothing more or less than a grand demonstration of the glory of God. And as God puts his glory on display throughout history, what the Holy Spirit has done in the Word of God is he has woven together the record of God putting His glory on display. From Genesis to Revelation, we have the record of the glory of God being put on display in history. And so here we are thousands of years later in the year 2016, and from the book of beginnings, from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, the Holy Spirit is telling us the story of our Savior by means, by making use of a man named Melchizedek who met Abraham after a war. The wisdom of God that he is able to take things from thousands of years ago and teach us tonight about himself and that he had this plan from all eternity and he works it all together and has woven it all together on the pages of his word. What an amazing God it is we serve. I stand in awe at his wisdom and his revelation on the pages of Scripture. Second, hand in hand with this, we stand in awe at the greatness and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as God puts His glory on display throughout history and on display throughout the course of Scripture, do you know who is always preeminent in that display of glory? Always preeminent is Jesus. That's by the Father's design and will. That He would be known in and through the person of His Son. And so as God puts His glory on display at every stage of salvation development, in every detail of divine salvation activity, He magnifies His Son. God's glory is seen in that He would give us His Son. God's glory is seen in that He would prepare the world for His Son throughout all the Old Testament revelation. What is God doing? He's preparing the world for His Son, to receive His Son, to recognize His Son when He comes. God is glorified in the timing of the appearance of His Son. Jesus came in the fullness of time. God is glorified by the arrangement of the dispensations of human history that are all arranged around the salvation activity of His Son. And this time that we're living in right now, this season of human history, from the time of the, of the creation of man until the time when Jesus comes again, it is going to reach its end in the second coming of His Son. Jesus is before all things. All things are held together together. By him. All things find their ultimate meaning in him. We stand in wonder at the Son of God, at the salvation 
that has been given to us in the Son of God. We stand in awe when we look at the author and the finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the writer is doing. He's saying, look at Melchizedek only, only to see Jesus. He resembles the Son of God. So that finally, we stand in humble shame and sorrow at the ability of the human race to so disrespect and disregard so great a salvation. God has put his glory on display in natural ways. You can go out tonight and look up at the night sky and there you see a statement about the glory of God. And God has revealed his glory in special ways. The revelation of scripture but then also the personal revelation of his son. God made his entrance into human history. And what he offers to mankind in his son is staggering. The forgiveness of all of our sins, reconciliation with our creator, sonship. Members of the family of God. And he says, what you must do is turn from your sins and trust in my son. The fact that men would hesitate in light of God's revelation concerning Jesus, that God would have to convince us, that God would have to say to believers, now you hold on to my son. Speaks of our foolishness, speaks of our sinfulness, it speaks of our weakness, it speaks of our absolute need for God's grace. How wicked we must be that God would have to convince us, exhort us to receive so great a salvation. Which means that if tonight you cherish God's Son, if you love Him, if you're devoted to Him, then you should get on your knees and thank God that you do. For without God's gracious, saving work in your soul, you would be in the same place where you began, in the place where the rest of humanity is, that is, in a place of treating the greatest treasure as if it's nothing. That's what the world is doing tonight, treating the greatest treasure God has ever given to mankind as if he's nothing. And the only reason we don't treat him like he's nothing is God had mercy upon our poor souls. And granted us life and light and understanding and love. Christian, get on your knees and thank God that he saved you. And then recognize he means to make use of you. To declare the wonders and the glories of his son. To the rest of a lost and dying humanity that men and women might come to faith in Jesus and God would be glorified in additional souls. There's your motivation for missions. There's your motivation for evangelism. There's your motivation for sharing the Word of God, that God would be glorified as He deserves to be glorified in His creation, mankind. But you're not ready to be a missionary until you're a humbled, thankful object of God's grace in your own eyes. Get on your knees and thank God that he's had mercy upon your poor soul so that you could see these wondrous truths about his son. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you've revealed your son to us. We thank you for the revelation of your glory in creation. We thank you for the revelation of your glory in Scripture. 
We thank you for the preeminent way that you have spoken to this world in your own Son. And we thank you that in our deadness and darkness, you had mercy upon our poor souls. You granted us repentance and faith. You made us your own. Our boast tonight is not that we are smart, not that we have good hearts, not that we are wise, not that we are noble, not that we are powerful. We have but one boast. We boast in the grace of God that has been known by us in Jesus. We boast in your Son. We thank you for having such mercy upon us and for making us your ambassadors to a lost and dying world. We ask that you would work mightily and powerfully through such weak vessels that many, many other souls would come to know the love and the joy and the peace and the purpose that's found in Christ. Oh, Lord, may you bring many to faith in your Son in these days, making use of these clay jars. We ask you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.